So welcome to you all. Welcome to Quantox uh, 3. And I'm extremely happy that uh, Professor uh, Ronnie Tomala has agreed to give the third talk in the series of Quantox. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie, for your time. Thank uh, you. I request uh, Yasser to introduce him. Okay, so thank you, uh, Professor MSR Rao. Thank you. It's an easy job for uh, Ronnie uh, uh, Yasser because he worked with uh, yeah. Professor Ronnie. So, so to, to, to be honest, I mean, Professor Ronnie yeah. Tumale doesn't need any introduction to the world yes. of theoretical and experimental condensed matter physicists. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, in this era where specialization and hyper specialization is increasing day by day, he represents one of the sort of rare breed of uh, physicists, uh, theoretical physicists whose sort of research is, you know, encompasses such, you know, diverse areas of condensed matter physics ranging from superconductivity to max. Uh, he works in very close collaboration with experimentalists from all different domains where he has always very innovative ideas to share with them. And uh, I mean, uh, so I mean, but the, given the fact that there are very young students also in the audience, some undergrads, some master's students and beginning PhD students, out of formality, I would like to, you know, uh, give a formal introduction. Uh, so Professor Tomale did his uh, PhD with the, in Karlsruhe at a time when Karlsruhe, you know, produced a, a really a very, uh, you know, a, a generation of young Turks in theoretical condensed matter physics. Uh, his, uh, he, his mentor was Professor Dr. Peter Wolfler one of the stalwarts of, of German physics. Um, uh, and uh, he did exceptionally well. And it's no wonder that he went subsequently for his postdoc to Princeton uh, to work with none other than Andre Bernevik. Uh, and he had a phenomenally productive time uh, uh, working uh, at Princeton and you know, collaborating with a range of uh, you know, people there. And um, uh, after his uh, you know, uh, uh, postdoctoral stint at, uh, at Princeton, he was offered the Stanford Institute of Theoretical Physics uh, Fellowship. So he was an SITP fellow, which is one of the most prestigious fellowships the, that are there uh, in the world in the, in the field of condensed matter. And he worked with uh, Professor Steve Kivelson, uh, whom all of us you know, have, uh, have, uh, have been influenced by over the last uh, you know, decades in uh, uh, working in condensed matter. And after working in Stanford, uh, I mean, he moved to EPFL Lausanne uh, as an assistant professor. Uh, but since he didn't like the French baguette too much and was missing German bakeries, he decided to move to Würzburg, where he was offered uh, associate professorship at an astonishingly young age of uh, 32. And uh, it is quite remarkable that within a couple of years, he established himself and his reputation and his work shown so much that he was offered the head of the, he became, he was offered the headship and he became the Lesch tool or the chair for the theoretical physics uh, division in Würzburg at an astonishingly and impressively young age of 34. Uh, he was, uh, if I may say, I think if my history is correct, the second youngest person to become a full professor in the history of uh, the University of Würzburg. Uh, so with this, I mean, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's an absolute honor for me to be introducing him and uh, he was also my postdoc advisor, and I consider myself very lucky to be one. And um, I would also like to mention in the end that he's also preparing to be a part of the European Space Mission, and he's training for that. So soon we might see him at the International Space Station. Okay, and uh, that's why, you know, he... <laughs> so uh, a man with all these interests can't be all bad. So let's welcome, uh, you know, Professor Rani Tomale, and it's a real pleasure. So, for Professor Tomale, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. No, so, uh, Professor Rao, um, uh, dear Yasser, um, uh, everyone listening, uh, thank you for inviting me to this web talk. And it is an honor for me to speak in front of this esteemed audience. Uh, let me just say, in particular, with people like Professor Rao, Professor Iqbal, and Baskaran, and Professor Nayaranan. Uh, I feel extremely honored to tell you about some research we've been, done, we've been doing lately. And I also would like to mention, since I recently joined the adjoint faculty at IIT Madras, I will be most happy to also teach lectures that might overlap with some of the research that I'll be telling you today. Uh, as a topic that I've chosen for this, if you wish, plenary talk, I try to across a couple of different directions of contemporary condensed matter research. 
and I have summarized it by the title, The New Frontier, Collective Phenomena in Synthetic Matter. And in the course of the talk, I'll try to explain what I mean by that. And I will emphasize the current questions that will probably keep us busy in the next decade to come. So um, the outline will be as follows. I will start my introduction with what I would call the late age of single particle topology. And this as a student that has not heard of what has been going on in condensed matter research in the past 20 years, this might sound very specific, but you will hopefully see in the talk that single particle topology is essentially, has essentially become ubiquitous in most current directions of um, research in condensed matter. And I will try to give you a historical overview of how this field crystallized and how it has been pursued in the past 20 to 30 years. I will then move on to the new frontier, as I said at the, as the talk title, and particularize to a certain platform where this non-linearity really materializes and becomes very explicit at the example of a system that all of us basically know from school days. This is why I have picked it. It will be the emergence of topology in a context as simple as electric circuits. And I will try to illustrate how nonlinearity will be one of the new key directions, one of the key new frontiers of contemporary research in synthetic matter. And since this is more or less emphasizing artificial systems as part of the wording synthetic matter, I also wish to point out that there will be quantum realizations of uh, synthetic matter that has particularly uprisen in the past two, three, four years. And I want to particularize to one special system of that type, namely um, Moray systems, or more specifically, for instance, twisted bilayer graphene, where a lot of research activity has been witnessed in the past um, three, four years. I mean, the discovery was in 2018. And since then, this has become an enormously big topic in Cummins matter. So let me start the whole talk by basically asking how did topological matter start? Topology is just the statement that there are some properties of the system that can either be linked to a topological quantity at a certain phenomenological level, or in a more mundane way, shows a particular robustness to local perturbations. And that is pretty much in line how mathematicians define topology, namely properties of space that are invariant under continuous deformations. Now, how this all has to do with integer quantum Hall effect is a talk on its own, but I want to highlight a few things that will be important for you to appreciate the history of the field. The integer quantum Hall effect was discovered by von Klitzing in Würzburg in 1980, and subsequently understood theoretically, one should say by Laughlin, uh, David Fowles and collaborators and Duncan Haldane. And so let me just keep it very simple. Uh, you see uh, the sketch of two dimensional electrons constrained to a plane that uh, corresponds to the slide. And then just imagine there's a magnetic field pointing into the slide. Accordingly, and that's already clear from a semi-classical picture, electrons will undergo cyclotron orbits, which I have highlighted by these closed circles and the arrow. And what you, mean, what you can imagine is that these are basically localized electrons and they're localized at the magnetic length. At the same time, however, something interesting already in the semi-classical picture is happening at the edge. If you imagine, if you imagine that this uh, semi-classical orbit bounces off elastically at the boundary, which is a fair assumption for the moment, you have the so-called skipping orbit highlighted in red, where you can see that even though the electrons in the bulk are localized, the electron at the edge manages to pass along the edge and as such uh, adhere itineracy. 
as opposed to the bulk electrons. And this bulk edge dissimilarity is in many systems at the heart of what topological states are about. What really becomes topological here at the phenomenological level um, is how the microscopic quantity sigma xy, which is just the off diagonal component of the conductivity tensor, depends on the quantities of the system. So you see the result, and it sounds a bit uh, innocent. The result is that it's just given by the quantum of conductance formed by the elementary charge squared divided by the Planck's constant, but it's multiplied by a churn number, so by a topological invariant called churn number found by Zhao Wei Chern in the late 40s of the last century. And it is a, a quantity that can only take integer values. Now, without going into detail what this really is, this result should make you stop and think because it's kind of amazing that a quantity so dependent supposedly so dependent on microscopic details of the samples and so on, only depends on some very general things, the quantum of conductance and some integer that is, that is derived from some topological invariant. And that is the remarkable thing about topology. Topology is a language we have now in the past 20, 30 years adopted in condensed matter, when in many cases where there's some sort of emergent universality in a system where the local parameters of the system don't seem to matter anymore when it comes to the observable quantities the system has to offer. And in that sense, integer quantum Hall effect is kind of a very good case for that. You see pretty much among the early measurements of the resistance as a function of magnetic field in the lower right part of the slide and According, we can talk a lot about this quantum Hall effect, but let me leave it for that because we have a lot of other stuff to talk about. All I want to say here is that this integer quantum Hall effect, strictly speaking, was not the first topological phase in condensed matter. Superfluid helium was earlier, um, for instance, but it was clearly the point at which the field really started to adapt extensively what people would now call a topological characterization of correlated electron states. And it's that time that really was a paradigm shift in uh, theory. And what happened after that, I tried hard to try to summarize it for you by three global expressions. Starting from this interstellar quantum Hall effect, what has happened in the past 30, 40 years? And I think we can summarize it by three words enhancement, deconstruction, and its extension. Let me try to illustrate in a few minutes what I mean by that. Always keep in mind, let's take the integer quantum Hall effect as the seed of the whole development. So the first thing is, of course, in integer quantum Hall effect in these MOSFETs or gallium aluminum arsenide, um, allium, gallium arsenide heterostructures, one observed this quantum Hall effect at very, very low temperatures. In fact, maybe this is interesting for you, von Klitzing, of course, had no expectation to find anything similar. He always, he only feel, felt the urge to measure more carefully semiconductors in the low temperature regime. And he did this very carefully. So that's what he came up with. Um, the question you can ask whenever such an effect happens and we have understood it as theorists and experimentalists, how could we enhance the operational conditions of that effect such that it could become more amenable, for instance, to technological applicability? And that's what I summarized by enhancement. And one paper that stands out among all the research activity in the past 40 years was the accomplishment of quantum Hall effect at room temperature. And it was managed to re be realized in graphene. Graphene has preeminently suited properties to show quantum Hall effect at fairly high temperatures. There's two features that come into that. First of all, the mobilities are incredibly high in graphene. And second, the dispersion relation is linear. There are these Dirac-ons, which if you recast them in the presence of a magnetic field, quickly make you realize that the quantum Hall effect 
is very nicely embedded into such a effectively Lorentz covariant dispersion relation. That's what I want to give as an example for what I mean by enhancement. The second word that I gave you was deconstruction. And maybe some of you know philosophy and uh, I don't know whether there exists Indian philosophy in this, this deconstructivist perspective, but there certainly exists European philosophy that I know of, for instance, Derrida. And what I mean by that here, just as a side remark is, take an effect in physics that we understood theoretically and measured experimentally, we can ask, are all these parameters that we tuned necessary prerequisites to observe the effect that we've seen? And that's what I call a deconstructivist viewpoint. Applied to the integer Cohn Horn effect, people realize that even though we initially started off with two dimensional electron gases in a strong external magnetic field, people showed uh, starting by 2013 in science papers, in several science papers, that indeed you can get quantum Hall type edge modes without an external magnetic field, where the role of the external magnetic field is replaced by the magnetic impurities you add to a given system. For instance, vanadium doped bismuth selenide films and other instances of um, um, effectively quantum Hall effect systems without an external magnetic field. And they gave it a different name. They call it quantum anomalous Hall effect. By now, just as a side remark for students, I think the nomenclature got a little bit confusing. There's an anomalous Hall effect. There's an anomalous quantum Hall effect and there's a quantum anomalous Hall effect. So you really have to make sure what you're talking about. It's also sometimes even colliding definitions in the literature, but you'll get through it uh, as you keep reading uh, more papers. Um, so that is what I want to show as, de as aspects of deconstruction. And the third is of course, say we have, again, let me start with the integer quantum Hall effect. We've seen it. Now, what do we do with it? Can we get the same effect? Get, can we make this effect more subtle? Can we extend its principal uh, phenomenology? And that was accomplished in yet, by yet another colleague in Würzburg, namely Professor Moenkamp, uh, in a science paper in 2007. And that's where the whole field of topological insulator started. In fact, the wording topological insulator does not come from Su Sheng Zheng and Lawrence Moenkam, but it's due to a paper by Joel Moore and Leon Balance that was written only a couple of months after this discovery. But anyways, I just wanted to give you the reference where the wording topological insulator comes from. And the interesting thing here is that instead of just having spin polarized electrons due to the external magnetic field, here there's no external magnetic field, but the spin orbit coupling is facilitated to effectively act as magnetic field of opposite sign, depending on whether you couple the field to an upspin or to a downspin. And accordingly, if I stay to this, if I stick to the semical picture that I showed you two slides ago or three slides ago, by analogy, it would just look like upspins um, um, denoted red propagating uh, clockwise and downspins propagating counterclockwise. There's a lot of more to be said here but let me just leave it with a statement that, again, you can ask in quantum spin Hall effect, can we again enhance it? Can we again deconstruct it and so on and so forth? So as you see, there's several uh, hermeneutic cycles that you can go, and that's exactly how you should view the research activity in the past 30 years. So for instance, you can ask again, say we take, uh, Laurens Mohenkamp's discovery at very low temperatures in mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, quantum worlds as a starting point, can we enhance the operability of this quantum spin Hall effect? And lately, we were lucky to find a system where we can actually see room temperature quantum spin Hall effect by analogy, the same thing that Andre Geim has had accomplished for the integer quantum Hall effect in graphene. All this was my introductory remarks for you to appreciate how in general topological states of matter have appeared. Up to this point, all the phenomena that I showed you can be recast as single particle physics. Now it is single particle quantum physics. So there is of course some subtle 
quantum many body features um, um, put in, but as a general matter of description, most of the phenomena that I just showed you can be recast as a simple kinetic energy term that is represented by a bilinear, where the bilinear would just be a creator and annihilator of any particle you can think. It can be electrons. In most of the cases here it was, but you can just think of any other excitations that does the job. Now let's hold on for a second and imagine what topology is about. Topology, due to Michael Berry, at least he was not the founder of it, but he really understood a nice way to conceptualize um, topology the way we understand it in condensed matter. Um, traced back these topological invariants I was talking about, like the churn number, he traced it back to aspects of parameter space of the system. And I emphasize that because what classical and quantum systems have in common or can have in common is their parameter space, but in which they differ is the phase space. Phase space is different in the quantum world versus the classical world, but parameter space doesn't necessarily have to be. There could be a continuous evolution of parameter space from a quantum system to a classical system. And this statement I just made that sounds very innocent was an absolute fundamental breakthrough in the whole field. Because so far, you would have naively thought it's called spin quantum, quantum Hall effect, integer quantum Hall effect, that all these effects are entirely reserved to the quantum world. And you have to worry about very subtle experiments. You have to make the De Broglie wavelength sufficiently big, and so on and so forth. But Duncan Haldane, as with many other fields in physics, was ahead of his time when he realized that this is not necessary. You can have classical systems where the same type of topology that people got excited by in the quantum context of integer quantum Hall effect or spin quantum Hall, quantum spin Hall effect can just equally be realized in a classical system. And the example he took in that paper, which he wrote together with Srinivas Raghu, who is now a professor at Stanford University, Back then he was his PhD student at Princeton, just took the concept of integer quantum Hall effect and asked, what is quantum about integer quantum Hall effect? And they realized that the topological feature of the integer quantum Hall effect, this edge mode features and this spark boundary correspondence I tried to allude to at this introductory slide is just not reserved to the quantum world at all. And then they took optics as a way to propose an, uh, a classical platform in which this is seen. Now, let me also clarify why I called optics a classical platform. Many of you are well aware of quantum optics. And obviously, there is quantum features in optics because photons are entirely quantum mechanical objects. They are bosonic particles. And of course, when you reduce the intensity of whatever light beam, sooner or later, you will reach the quantum limit unavoidably. The point I'm trying to make is, if you are avoiding this rare event type of quantumness of photons, then you can have an entirety of optics where you wouldn't have needed any quantum physics. Uh, Bohr and Heisenberg wouldn't need to be born in order to do optics and actually history uh, performatively uh, assures that because optics was a very well de developed subject before any kind of quantum mechanics was found. Now, what they do here is they use an effectively classical environment in a photonic crystal to show phenomena that basically we thought would be reserved to integer quantum Hall effect, namely boundary modes that are chiral and that are particularly robust to perturbations. And this paper, I can't emphasize it enough. I try to arrange this web talk solely tailored to students. And I know hopefully I'm not, uh, I'm not too slow for some of the esteemed audience, but I still want to highlight for students interested in the matter. That's the paper where you should start from. Because as you can see, this paper took three years to get published or approximately three years to get published. It shows you how much this paper was ahead of its time. And it also shows you that you should so 
that you, you should show perseverance, perseverance as you're go undergoing certain uh, referee re reporting. If the submission takes long, it doesn't mean that you're on the wrong track. It might actually mean that you're on a very interesting track. Now, from this paper on, a lot of stuff happened in the field and people realized, okay, if these type of topological states of matter are not reserved to the quantum world, we have a lot of classical platforms in which they can be found. And then this unleashed a field, which if you just go by citations, easily has overtaken the original field of quantum Hall physics. Like if you accumulate the citations that quantum Hall physics has generated, it's a lot, admittedly. But if you look at how much has happened in optics since then, it's kind of astounding because there is a lot of hope in optics to have new technologies, to have new employment of topological physics that back then one wasn't really sure of how to do it in the quantum world and one still isn't. For instance, you could think of a cell phone where all the electronic pulses would be carried by quantum Hall edge modes. Because as we all know, they are not only topological, they are also dissipationless. So it would be a very energy efficient phone. But the problem obviously at that moment is the external magnetic field. And in all Ronnie, these other I, systems, we're still Ronnie, very- can I, a, sure. can I ask a question? So um, uh, is, what, is there something non-linear about these things? That actually not yet. I can't, okay. that's, that, that will be the upshot of my final conclusive remark on the introduction. And maybe you, I know, I know the slides well, but if you see it only shortly, maybe you're not aware of them. I called it the late age of single particle topology. Okay, that, okay. That's supposed to be my conclusive statement of the introduction. With all the activity so, but, that, okay. yeah. What is the parameter they tune? Um, to get into this topology or whatever you would call the equivalent of a topological phase in these things? Most of, in most cases, you need some phase attachment to propagation. That's ah, okay. really the point. Okay. And okay. there's all sorts of way to, can, to, to be able to see that the essence a classical system has to show in order to be in principle amenable to topological phases. I would say it's just my wording in my papers it's simply interference. Um, a, a platform has to be capable of exhibiting interference. As soon as this is there, you can build berry phases, you can build topological states of matter. Uh, and just, and thanks uh, Raj for the question that exactly brings me to the final statement I wanted to make for my introduction. Uh, it is basically saying that all what I told you so far was not only single particle topology, it was also the majority of those systems entirely can be thought of as effectively linear. And what I mean by effectively linear is that all these uh, single particle states, if you think about them at the level of equations of motion, you will never see a nonlinear term in the um, differential equation that describes this evolution. Of course, some of these systems have nonlinear effects, but they have never been pivotal to the topological state. And at an abstract level of description, none of these fields ever had to implement nonlinearity in the classical domain or interactions in the quantum domain as a prerequisite to establish the topological state they want to see. And that's what I call the late age of single particle topology, because in all these fields across the board, the new frontier starts to appear um, that we want to look for topological states and the tunability of topological states that crucially involves either interactions, that's the language that people usually adopt in quantum systems because electrons interact strongly and instantaneously, so of course the differential equation would have nonlinear terms, but it's a very specific type of nonlinearity that people talk about typically in quantum systems of correlated electrons. That would be, that's what we call interactions. And in all these classical platforms, we would use the general expression nonlinearities, and they can come from all sorts of terms that you add. 
So that's the main, basically, that's why I assigned so much time to this part of my talk. That's the main message I want to show you. The new frontier in all these fields starts to appear. Okay, say we have a classical system with topology. How does nonlinearity change our picture? Or say we have a quantum, mostly electronic system can also be other bosonic degrees of freedom, like magnons or something. How would interactions modify the picture we have gained from single particle topology? And it's quite interesting if you go deeper into all these fields, you see that all the reviews that are regularly written on the topic, they all come back to this question. In optics, they ask, how do we approach nonlinear optics, nonlinear topology? In topological insulators, they ask, what would interacting topological states of matter be? So it's a, a very good timing to ask, What's this new frontier like and how can we address it? What are first attempts to enter those different fields? And I know I have to pay um, attention to the time. I have now used 25 to 30 minutes to get you this main idea, but I think it was worth it such that you know where the field is heading and that's the main uh, message I wanted to convey. Now let me be a bit more specific and pick two specific cases in short, where recent effort has been made to tackle this new frontier. And let me start with classical systems and nonlinear topological classical systems, and more specifically, the platform that I introduced, that I mentioned before, electric circuits or topological states in electric circuits, we called topoelectric circuits in the first paper we wrote on it in 2017. Um, I might not have time now to go into all details. I'll leave that to the discussion. Um, essentially, what I want to, what I wanted to do initially in this field of electric circuits, I wanted to play with it a little and see whether I can build band structures of arbitrary liking by just using electric circuit elements. And the short story is, this is very conveniently possible. Um, initially, you might just say, uh, it's a network of different nodes. The nodes of the circuit play the role of the sites. If you want to take the condensed matter analogy of a crystal and electrons um, hopping, hopping around in a crystal, you, sh you should say that the connectivity is determined by the electronic components and the nodes of the circuits play the role of the sites in the crystal. Um, Kirchhoff's law is all you need. Um, you will have a, a, an equation of motion that looks very similar to a damped uh, um, um, itinerant electronic model. Um, and um, that's the thing I want to start with. And the, um, the simplest case I want to show you just pictorially for you to visualize what I'm telling you about because I don't have the time. The topoelectric circuits would be a talk on their own, but maybe I can give at some later stage in the coming months to the students at uh, IIT, I can give another talk on it or an extensive lecture, series of lectures on it. Let me just illustrate what we had in mind when we started the field um, by the probably simplest topological state available. That is the Su schriefer heger model from 1979. Schriefer, who got the Nobel Prize for Superconductivity and Andrew Heger, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, Maybe some of you know about it. It was an early work in which people noticed that in polyacetylene, you have these dangling bond electronic states that you can be, that can be sort of um, isolated, um, 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 degrees of freedom, which later turned out to be um, classifiable from a topological language. So in the topological language we now adopt in modern times, it is not a strictly topological state, but it's a system with an obstructed atomic limit, which yields a topological boundary mode when you are interfacing the two different atomic limits this state has to offer. I know it sounds complicated, but I want to be precise here. And as you get into the meta, you'll appreciate why this strictly speaking is not a perfectly topological protected state. But the main thing I wanted to show you here is simply, how does this look like an electric circuit? And you see this 
the sequence of double bonds between the carbon and single bonds. And this is just represented by two capacitors of different capacitors. That's all you need. Even forget about the inductors for the moment. Really to zeroth order, all you need is a sequence of alternating capacitors. And our question was, can I rebuild this topological feature that Sue and Schriefer and Heger had found in 1979, just in something as simple as an electric circuit? And the answer is yes, this is all simulation. I'll talk about it another time. Um, the upshot was that this system, if you know it electronically, it gives rise to a zero energy mid-gap state at the boundary of that chain of carbon atoms. And this zero energy state, how does that translate to the circuit? The answer is it will be a zero energy eigenstate of the circuit Laplacian, which basically relates, whose eigenvalues relate to the admittance of that circuit. So by analogy, if it's at zero admittance, it means it's, it's as divergent impedance. Of course, you have damping, so you will never see a perfect divergence, but we will see a strong peak in the impedance mimicking the presence of such a topological mid-gap state. That was the upshot our early, of our early work. And those were the uh, experiments. So the nice thing in the Sushrifer Heger model is you can now switch between the limits very easily. You just have to start with the opposite capacitor. Like you just have to change the unit cell sequence by half of one unit cell. And then accordingly you switch between the presence of a mid-gap state or the absence of a mid-gap state. And that's what we could do in an electric circuit. And this sequence of capacitors show an amazing signal, depending on whether I start with the small capacitor or the large capacitor, the impedance this circuit shows is either as small as fractions of an ohm or up to 1000 ohm. So just changing the boundary condition of this electric compound changes the impedance by four orders of magnitude. And to an electrical engineer, and I know the IIT at its core is an electrical engineering institute, this sounds kind of crazy because uh, it seems like just change, it's an entirety of a circuit and you're just not changing much. You're just changing the boundary condition. You're not changing any of the other components. You're just changing the sequence, whether it starts with the small capacitor or the big capacitor, but it still manages to change the impedance by four orders of magnitude. But as physicists, we know what it is. Either the topological mid-gap state is there or it isn't there. And this topological mid-gap state carries the majority of the impedance. And as a consequence, you see the strong deviation in impedance as to whether the mid-gap state is there or not. From there, we really started the field in 2017. And when you now check the archive and see how many papers have happened, maybe there's about uh, 300 papers total now on topoelectric circuits. It was quite funny to see that uh, happening, but I also want to encourage collaborations at IIT on this topic because it very nice overlaps with questions of electrical engineering. For the sake of this talk, however, I leave it with this remark and cut right to the main point of this talk, what this talk is about, Hi, namely yes. how, yes? Hi, this is Ian, we met uh, earlier in Boost. Yes. So uh, is this model that you are discussing, this uh, electrical circuit, can it be understood in some sense as a discrete version of the Rebbe Jacquieu model field theory? Which oh yeah, so that is a question independent of the circuit realization. And the Jakiv Rebi model is, is more general. You know, the Jakiv Rebi model just means that I just, uh, I, I, I basically um, take an exponential ansatz and integrate up to the boundary and then model the boundary this way and have an interpolation from one side to the other side and find a boundary mode and then characterize this boundary mode. So this Jakiv Rebi construction includes the Sushrife Hege model, but is not exhausted by it. Yes. So, but in some sense, you are doing some, uh, it's like a you're replacing the electrons with some kind of field, right? The field is simply the current in a way, is it? Uh, oh, yeah. So, okay. So, the electrons in a quantum system 
are replaced essentially by, how should I say, voltage pulses in the electric circuit. But that analogy is not exactly, is it not exactly one-to-one. -one. Uh, one should be careful there. The main point really is, and that is probably intuitive to everyone, electric circuits are amenable to interferences because we have imaginary contributions to resistance. And that helps to engineer phase-dependent hybridization elements in the adjacency matrix, most technically speaking. And that yeah. is a sufficient and necessary condition for developing topological states of matter, at least of that kind that I showed you, basically topology in momentum space. Yeah, I'm just asking this because I was thinking if the nonlinearity that we're going to discuss has to and also mimic some field theories like John Simmons or where there are these nonlinear. Uh, there are a couple of papers that have appeared lately, most lately, where people try to picture field theories in circuits. It really started, uh, I can send you the paper. It's another group. Uh, it started one or two months ago, some electrical engineering department. I, I have to look it up. But indeed, um, the circuits are so simple and so accessible that it's very tempting to ask on more general grounds what other kind of phenomena can we put into them. And in fact, I by myself in my group has, have learned that uh, it's not even exhausted by topological physics. I want to study chaotic phenomena in these circuits that are probably hardly accessible by any other method simply due to, by any other platform, simply due to the simplicity of the circuits. But let me just sketch it and you see that's fairly a young field. That is one of our latest papers on nonlinear topological circuits, which we did with, the, with a group of applied mathematics at MIT. It was just published a couple of weeks ago. And the point now is we can, for instance, ask by adding nonlinear circuit elements, how is a topological state that we would have realized in a circuit affected by it? And um, I, I, I apologize that I don't have that much time um, for this in this overview talk, but you can already see a little bit here on that slide, you see one of the main messages in our paper, namely that the nonlinearity affects the bulk modes very differently from the topological edge modes. So the nonlinearity response basically makes an emergent distinction between the bulk modes and the edge modes. This is important to notice because in a topological language, the bulk modes and the edge modes sort of belong together. That's what affirms under the name bulk boundary correspondence. Here we see that the response of the edge modes differs from the response of the bulk modes in a fundamental way. You can see it here to the left lower side. You see that you also see it in the phase diagrams to lower right. So the cyclic orbit is attained in a very uh, non-regular fashion for the bulk mode. So this nonlinearity really acts as to give rise to this bumpy signature, whereas the edge mode is just entirely oscillatory as if there's hardly any nonlinearity. And you see that in the phase diagram where just a little bit of damping leads to the fact that we start the cyclic orbit at the outer, at the outer rim and then um, um, uh, evolve into the, uh, into the origin. There's a question by Siva RK. Uh, hi, Ronnie. Sorry to interrupt you, but this may be a good point to play for a point in time to place this question. So I, I just am tempted to ask you, is there a relationship between uh, the wavelength of this voltage pulse that you're using in the process and the size of these circuit elements. Is there a, a relation relationship? So what if one were to be much bigger than the other or something like that? Uh, would things matter at all? Do um, you mean the physical size? Do you mean yes. the physical size of the circuit elements? Oh, you see, that's a, a, a very subtle question. So first of all, whenever we need uh, inductors, it's a bit unfortunate because they can't be highly integrated. So these inductors, at least those that I buy, they don't become arbitrarily small. So we have to solder them really and they take some space on the circuit board. Whereas the uh, capacitor-based um, 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 structures that we build, 
we could in principle highly integrate. And that's of course a question I would like to address to electrical engineers, where would there be angles and overlaps of common interest here? Um, unfortunately, I would like to talk more about it. I can show you, for instance, that there is certain small size dependencies, but the general idea is at the operation level that we, at the level that we operate, namely in the kilohertz regime, these questions don't severely matter. So all we were interested in up to this point, uh, Siva, is to realize the conceptual topological state of matter. We never asked for performance uh, extending it to a highest possible frequency. And you see, I'm a theory, uh, I'm a theorist. My theory group started to buy lock-in amplifiers and so on. They're a little bit expensive as you go to the, as you go beyond the megahertz regime. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So we just started slowly and we are still in the kilohertz regime. But obviously your questions that you raise will be way more decisive when the operating frequency of such a circuit reaches a megahertz uh, uh, regimes and beyond. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But uh, I don't insist on you answering the next question right away, but maybe in the discussion, I just want to put this thought in your mind. If I go back to the polyacetylene molecule, then okay. I'm going to play with that and a pulse instead of the circuit and, and pulses, then yeah. what, what should I take care? But maybe you could answer, we could discuss this even at the end and I shouldn't interrupt the flow of your talk too much. No, no problem. We can discuss that later. It's, it's a specific question we can put uh, um, to the discussion. Let me just, um, at least I just, I can't resist by showing you because I really like this. That's the last thing I want to show you on circuits because I'm running out of time. But we started off with integer quantum Hall effect. So, and I made big statements that uh, all these topological states can be realized in a classical system. So this we actually did. So we took the Haldane model, the lattice Haldane model for the quantum Hall effect and put it into a circuit. And this is the circuit diagram of the unit cell for the Haldane model. And in case you don't feel very comfortable staring at this rectangular connections, this is how electrical engineers usually plot it. Maybe this, uh oh, well, how do I go back? Yeah, maybe this is closer to what you have in mind when in case you have ever read Duncan Haldane's uh, paper. Um, uh, this is the, uh, if I just rearrange the circuit connections, this is how it looks. And you see below the circuit Laplacian, which for the moment, you might just look at it as an effective Hamiltonian. And it contains all the terms you would ever want it for a Haldane model. We can even tune the Semenov mass term we can tune the Holden mass term and we can literally see everything that is in the Holden model. We see the chiral anomaly. We see um, the, the, sorry, the par that what Duncan calls the parity anomaly. Um, we see the, the trivial insulator regime where the Semenov mass dominates and we see the chiral boundary mode of the insulator um, where the chiral mode is there where the Holden mass dominates. By the way, my language will always stay in condensed matter. So when I call it an insulator, I mean the structure of the spectrum, which we then see in the admittance spectrum of the circuit. Of course, the circuit by itself is not an insulator. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, I don't have time for this, even though it's kind of funny. Maybe I show this in the discussion in case someone is still listening. Um, let me just finish by saying we can also build more complicated states via semi-metallic uh, circuits and there was this whole field of non-emission physics where I believe the circuits are now at the forefront of innovation. Like the circuits were the first in which uh, one could see new effects that emerged out of this direction, which basically um, came, like basically got more attention since 2017, 2018. Um, for instance, the non-emission skin effect, I don't have time for that, was uh, basically first seen in circuits and we even took the circuits as an inspiring starting point to make suggestions in optics, for instance, to build a topological light funnel where we use this non-hermission, uh, um, the insights about the non-hermission skin effect we attained from the circuit model to build an optical model in which we basically accumulate light from a finite area and accumulate it at the boundary. And as such, we hope 
we will be able to build new uh, um, higher sensitive optical detectors. Now this is enough about uh, this is enough about circuits, and I know I'm sh running short on time. Still, I want to make some statements also about quantum systems, where I want to justify that they have similarly reached a new frontier. Namely, I mentioned integer corner Hall effect, quantum spin Hall effect. All these phenomena could be understood at the single particle level, and now with the new arena of synthetic matter and um, synthesis techniques uh, that have now appeared also in quantum systems, we are reaching a new domain of correlated electron systems in which many parameters can be changed at will, which previously we never hoped we could ever change. And if you now uh, imagine you take these sentences that I just said and put them maybe 20, 25 years early, those were the same sentences that the ultra cold atomic gas people mentioned. But there's a big difference. Now, in modern uh, quantum experimental condensed matter physics, one can build systems, one can start, one starts to be able to build systems at will in which the ratio T over Tf, where Tf is the Fermi temperature, is very low. So we can really reach the quantum many body domain which at least to a large extent has been and probably will be inaccessible to ultra cold atomic gas systems. And so that's what I would call synthetic quantum electron condensates, where by quantum electron condensates, I mean collective electronic states, such as superconductors or magnets, which can be recast as a quantum electron condensate, but which necessitates the presence of quantum physics, obviously, to be there. And one of these big advances was the discovery um, of twisted bilayer graphene in 2018 by Pablo Jarillo Herrero at the MIT, and they um, preceded by the theoretical work by Alan McDonald and Bistritzer. Uh, it's even a tough name for me as a German, even though I guess the German the name is German. I guess in its origin. Uh, so um, they found the idea that if I just tilt two honeycomb lattices slightly against each other, the effective unit cell becomes big. Well, that's sort of obvious, but on top of that, the electronic structure is very interesting because there are effective interference effects that render those emergent electronic bands essentially flat, at least very, very flat. And then at the same time, due to the large unit cell, the Vanke orbitals of that system become huge. They are of the order of, of nanometers. And what this means is they will probably be very amenable to, to experimental modification because these Vanke orbitals all of a sudden are so big in a generic electronic system, in a non-synthetic quantum electronic system, like take some material then the typical extent of the Vanier orbitals is of the order of a couple of angstroms. And then it's very hard to modify, say, the dielectric environment of these electronic states. So the cell screening is so dominant that in most correlated electron systems we have known in the past, all these questions didn't really matter how the environment looks. So the tunability was very much limited to the very experimental um, electronic system we synthesized. But now with an existing system with huge Vanier orbitals, a lot of tunability comes into play, which has previously been inaccessible. And that's the case here. That's the first phase diagram that people showed. And you see, um, um, Baskaran is not only a friend of mine, but also one of the scientists worldwide that I uh, admire the most. So I couldn't resist to put in this phase diagram because it looks very familiar to Basturan from the cuprates. The, the twisted bilayer graphene community at the beginning was very much excited when they looked into this and were thinking that maybe they have reached a tunable platform similar to cuprates. That's the style in which this nature paper from 2018 is written. In all honesty, one must say, one must admit this picture would need severe revision because it seems such that 
the phononic contribution in twisted bilayer graphene is dominant. And if you're interested, I can give you uh, more details about it. If you want to read up on it, I, when I refereed some nature papers of that, I was asked to write a news and views on precisely that question, which got published in 2021. Now, the last thing that I wanted to highlight, instead of going to superconductors where, as I said, the superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene might be due to phonons, and I don't want to touch the topic in these few minutes that I have left, I instead want to go to um, ask, is there some other obviously and necessarily quantum infused collective electronic state that we can expect in these moraine materials? And there is, there is magnetism. In principle, there could be magnetism. And there are very interesting recoupling theories uh, that have lately been worked out, for instance, by Leon Ballens and his group uh, and other people. Uh, and the question I want to ask is now, since the, this is a recoupling theory for magnetism, um, it's very likely that we would need a strong coupling theory for magnetism where we basically start from a localized magnetic picture and then develop the theory from there. And for a strong coupling theory in magnetism, one first would need a Vanier projection onto the low-lying Moray orbitals. That's challenging, but hopefully doable. And one needs an effective Moray Heisenberg modeling, which is to say, once you have these Vanier orbitals, can I get a good ab initio description of what the effective Heisenberg Hamiltonian or similar Hamiltonian looks like that we would find in such systems. And in that case, uh, uh, there's a scaling problem in magnetism that always happens, in particular in frustrated magnetism. When you ask about typical Heisenberg models in, in MOT insulators, um, then the typical spin exchange coupling is orders of magnitude bigger in terms of energy scale than the magnetic orders that sets in, the quantum magnetic order that sets in, and even more so when we get to the regime of frustrated magnetism, where not all magnetic exchange bonds can be satisfied simultaneously. So there is a big scaling problem. And whenever theorists talk about a scaling problem, usually the solution has to do with the randomization group because we want to connect the energy scales at which the Heisenberg Hamiltonian operates with the effective emergent collective states that appear many uh, many orders of, orders of magnitude lower in energy. And I just mentioned that there is one method that um, Yasser Iqbal has mastered uh, and severely pushed forward in the past years. This uh, starts from apricose of fermions. You're replacing the magnetic spin degrees of freedom. You essentially get a fermionic problem that you can then treat with diagrammatic uh, randomization group techniques and Yasser Iqbal is one of the leading contributors to this field. Um, and in case, uh, that's a side remark to the students, in case you're interested in that, you please just go to Yasser and ask about it. Um, all I wanted to say here is we have methods to address the collective phenomena in synthetic materials in order to um, make progress there uh, superconductivity, I should also say, can in principle be very interesting here, leaving, as, leaving, a, leaving aside the question whether it's phononic in this particular case or not. These synthetic materials, I'm absolutely certain of that, sooner or later will give us unconventional superconductors of extremely interesting, with extremely interesting properties. There's, for instance, one proposal by Marcel Franz and collaborators from Vancouver which I think is very far from the experimental reality, but still I would say it is worth thinking about. Um, it's basically saying that one takes a bilayer of cuprate type systems where one just rotates the two layers by uh, uh, 60 degrees or in this, uh, well, for hexagonal, and in this case um, by um, 45 degrees. And as you do that rotation and enhance the coupling between the layers, there could be a state um, emerging in this system that Baskaran was among the first, together with Bob Laughlin, to predict in general in, in physics, namely a chiral superconducting state of matter, in this specific case, a state 
that is a complex superposition of two D-wave order parameters. And that's actually a topological state of matter that no one has seen up to this point. And it would be, or at least not unambiguously, there, is some, there are some experiments, but this would be a fascinating direction where these synthetic materials could go. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Let me just finish by saying, um, in this scope of quantum materials where synthetic topological matter addresses the question, how do interactions drive us into collective many body states like magnetism or superconductivity, or how, how does a topological insulator gets amended by interactions? Here, we need some more numerical development because these things are quite hard to tackle. And that's one software project I have recently initiated I call it Horus um, uh, for horizons of new horizons of unconventional superconductivity. Uh, and what we are currently planning is we are developing open source numerics to take a van der orbital model and some interactions that you pick or fix by constraint upper A calculations, for instance, to run different randomization group schemes to essentially get an educated guess on the typical type of instability, be it itinerant magnetism or superconductivity, nematicity, starch density waves, and so on. Uh, that could give rise to that. And with that, we hope that we can help to also provide some new tools for the community to push this field forward. If you're interested, I'm happy to ask any questions, uh, to answer any questions. Let me recap what I told you and such that the detailed last bits of my talk don't um, dilute the main message I wanted to give you. I think we are at a very interesting time in condensed matter theory. Topology has taken over a lot of descriptions and a lot of uh, uh, area in condensed matter, but particularly single particle topology has been successful and basically uh, been applied all over the place. But we're witnessing now a need for new tools and new perspectives to take the next step. Because now we have single particle topology mastered, uh, what is the next thing? What's the new frontier? And my claim is for classic systems, it will be a systematic intertwining of topology and nonlinearity. And for quantum system, it will be a systematic intertwining of interactions and topology. And I have particularized to two representatives of each of the two domains, one being nonlinear topoelectrical circuits, the other one being synthetic quantum electron condensates, namely magnetism and superconductivity in Moray systems. And I believe there will be a lot to be done. There will a lot to be done uh, the, uh, in the future. And it will be exciting to see how this field of condensed matter, and in particular, topological condensed metaphysics will be capable of covering these emergent fields of nonlinearity and interactions. And with this, I want to thank my group in Würzburg and thank you for your attention. Hey, great, thank you so much, Ronnie, for a wonderful talk and for taking us through all the uh, recent state of the art and taking place in condensed matter and its interface with other branches. So we really appreciate that. And uh, so now the floor is open to questions. Uh, those are already uh, quite some enthusiasm. So we can continue that if you have any comments or questions. Uh, Roni, I have uh, just a couple of short questions. Um, so one question is about this topological electric circuits. Yes. Um, I mean, we have you know, amplifiers, oscillators, LCR circuits, and so on. So electrical engineers have lot, built a lot of circuits over decades. Now, can you identify some circuit where there is some element of topology? You mean, unknowingly, they have. Are there some known circuits like that? Oh, yeah. So, OK, I, I hope I get your question right. So let me say one thing. I'm absolutely certain that a lot of aspects of this topoelectrical circuits can be effectively rediscovered 
in decades of electrical engineering research that has already happened. Mm -hmm. It's just very likely that electrical engineers never adopted the language of topological phases because there wasn't so much need for that. Still, topology of networks mm -hmm. was a very active topic in electrical engineering. And I must tell you that by I have entered the field three, four years ago, and I'm still reading up on all the electrical engineering literature that exists on related topics. So I can't even make the conclusive claim on that. I can't tell you precisely how much had already been appreciated in the domain of electric engineer of electrical engineering. It's really fascinating because as you said at the beginning, there are lots of fantastic electric engineers at IIT Madras. Yes. Yeah, I really it's feel very important that to have joint uh, discussions about it. Yeah. That's I think important. so too. I think so too. And I must also say. Uh, that these are fairly, okay, let me say that these are fairly low-hanging fruits. It's not very difficult, honestly, at this mm -hmm. moment, because we are fairly early in the field. And basically, it's often just a matter of translation from some quantum electronic model to some circuit model. But then mm -hmm. now that we see how flexible circuits are, and now even one can't even imagine how much can be done because we haven't even started with nonlinear circuit elements, diodes, um, um, more subtle uh, composite circuit elements, uh, mm -hmm. memristors, transistors, we have not used them at all. And at this moment, at this moment, I feel what our main office would be for, as a physicist is explaining the language of topological phases to electrical engineers together with learning from you how topoelectric circuits would be presented and verbalized in an electrical engineering context, which is something that I just don't know. To give you a small uh, uh, story, maybe some of you know Eugene Mele. Eugene Mele is a professor at University of Pennsylvania, and he's by trade, he, well, maybe soon at some point he might get a Nobel Prize for the paper with uh, for the papers with Charles Kane, but he was a very well known scientist before that. And he was an electrical engineer by training. And he uh, and David DiVincenzo, they visited Würzburg at some point. And when I talked to them on the board and talked to the top electrical circuits, they gave me three books of a compendium of different um, electric <laughs> circuit elements. And these books are fairly thick. And I have, and I, I told them, I mean, Eugene, uh, I have no, I mean, how can I read through this? These are just too many components. So I think I need a better guide, uh, a bit, I need some guidance and understanding how I pinpoint the most interesting electric components for the purpose of realizing topological states. For instance, we just came across an impedance a negative impedance converter through current inversion. And that was super helpful for us to break reciprocity and as a consequence to realize the whole Dane model, for instance. And we oh, noticed exactly. that this was just on one of these pages of these books. And of course, it's an amazingly useful element for us to rebuild topological states. And it's now all over the place, like all other groups now have adopted this INIC but we noticed that in these electrical engineering books, there wasn't even a symbol for the INIC. So we basically invented our own symbol. That was this arrow thing. Yeah. So you found a new grammar or you're throwing a new light. Yeah, so, so I think to a large extent, now that this has become so interdisciplinary, it would be amazingly helpful for my group and in general, if we could intensify this collaboration, because I should also say, that Würzburg has no engineering department. I have no electrical engineer at my university. And now that Yassir, who was uh, generous enough to make the suggestion to make me become part or affiliated part of the faculty at IIT, I think it's a perfect topic that we can just bring in to our uh, joint um, area of interest. In fact, you know, I think I will ask MSR Rao to 
asked the director of IIT Madras, Bhaskar Ramamurthy, an electrical engineer, to listen to your talk. No, we we have uh, we have an expert. I think we have a couple of experts in the electrical engineering department, including uh, uh, Shanti Pawan. Um, you know, uh, Ronnie, the w one way to uh, get our electrical engineering people interested in this is it's very exciting what you talked about topological mode measurements where we showed this very exciting Z versus uh, frequency curve. So if you can somehow uh, uh, push this frequency level to the microwave uh, frequency level, they'll all, they'll all get excited about it because then they talk about that they're in the telecom domain, no? Yeah, that's the hope, of course. Uh, I, I, agree. I agree. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think uh, uh, so. so when, when you visit IIT Madras, we'll also give you an office in the electrical engineering department. So then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there, there's, there's this is Krishnandu is there. Uh, yeah, right. sure. Yeah. I think yeah. Yeah. it will. I think it only can be done through a professional visit because it will take time to adapt the language. A talk right. doesn't help. One has yes. to go to the board, start simple, and get the language straight. And so when are you coming? Well, as soon as uh, my uh, employer <laughs> allows me to, uh, to travel again. I have a question. Can I uh, ask it? Yes, please. Please go ahead, please. So this is the question regarding the uh, superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene. Okay. Uh, I missed a point that you were trying to make. Uh, you were trying to convey that phononic contribution could also could give rise to this. Uh, what is your take on this? I mean, what is the topological aspect that uh, when you have grouped it in, uh, I mean, in your talk, you are trying to say, convey that this is actually uh, some manifestation of topological effects, but that could be true phononic uh, contribution that could be driving the superconductor. Could you just elaborate on this? Yes. And I'm sorry if I have been a little bit unclear on this. Let me distinguish the statements I wanted to make in case I haven't made them. First, the superconducting phase by itself is most likely not topologically non-trivial. But aspects of topology have appeared in the context of twisted bilayer graphene at many different angles. One topic that you want to look at is fragile topology of the band structure, where basically compendia of different band arrangements give rise to, potentially give rise to boundary modes and even bulk phenomena that can be, can be traced back to what people call fragile topology. But I didn't have time to address it in the talk at all. The superconducting state in twisted bilayer graphene will most likely be non-topological. Given that people like Baskaran listen, of course, it's also important to ask, is this superconductor of conventional origin or of unconventional origin? That's an entirely different question from whether it's topological or non-topological. And on that part, I wanted to express that the original hope for twisted bilayer graphene, and I'm trying to go back, but I sometimes Somehow I can, no, I hopefully I can go back. Um, here, when you go to this phase diagram, this phase diagram was intentionally chosen in this nature paper in 2018 to suggest that twisted bilayer graphene is most like an unconventional superconductor. And people got super excited about it. I think people should still be excited about, un about twisted bilayer graphene but most likely it is not an unconventional superconductor. That is a question independent of whether it's topological or not. The one topological superconductor that I mentioned, where I also mentioned that Bascon was among the first to find it, to discover it in nature, or to, no, to propose it as a theorist, and was the second proposal by Marcel Franz, where they take two cuprate layers and try to manufacture an overlay of two cuprate layers rotated by 45 degrees. And that D plus ID state, that one is topological because the volume of bands have a churn number of two. So hopefully I, got, I could distinguish now the different features of that. And the thing, and you also ask why I believe that twisted bilayer graphene is not an unconventional superconductor. I didn't mention it in the talk, but I can now in the discussion. 
there have been several experiments done on twisted bilayer graphene, which I found super elegant and interesting. Namely, they put a screening layer of graphite just separated by some uh, boronitride spacer, um, and they varied the distance of the screening layer to the twisted bilayer graphene. Now, the big plus of twisted bilayer graphene is that the Vanya orbitals are several, like 10 nanometers big. So they also extend out of the plane. So within experimental reachable distances, I can now vary the impact of the screening layer and see whether screening the electronic interactions has an impact on the superconducting phase in twisted bilayer graphene. And the observation in that experiment, it was done by Dima Yefetov at the Barcelona uh, Center for, for Graphene. The, the result was that the superconductor in twisted bilayer graphene does not care. You can screen the interactions at will and the TC and whatever doesn't change. The only thing that changes is that the previously insulating domains are basically eaten up by the superconductor. But the superconducting domains don't change in TC. And when you ask an expert on unconventional superconductivity and you tell him, or you go, to, uh, I'm sorry that I keep coming back to Baskaran, but you ask Baskaran, hey Baskaran, I can change the interactions, I can cut the interactions in half. What should happen to TC? Like the first answer will be, oh, a TC should actually go down because I mean, when interactions are smaller, then the whole um, spin fluctuation scales at which superconductivity forms are reduced accordingly. But nothing is changing. So that to me gives a strong hint that the mechanism for superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene is most likely phonon driven. And in that sense of conventional nature, with this being said, it's most likely a highly unconventional way of conventional phonon driven superconductivity. But that's another topic. Thank you. So, so Ronnie, uh, I have uh, a question in continuation of this uh, discussion. I, I, I thought superconductivity in twisted graphene occurs only at a particular angle theta that is not more than 1.5 degrees. That's, that, that's a critical thing for experimentalists to exactly place these two layers at that angle, is it not? So, uh, no, no. So the, the magic angle that you heard of is the one where the band structure becomes okay. basically perfectly flat. But the superconductor is a bit more forgiving than the other states there. Like if they don't match it perfectly for sufficiently low temperatures, they still see a superconductor. And the reason is that two things happened, Professor Rao, two things happened there at the same time. These guys understand now to build these systems to a purity and a high mobility that was unprecedented. And on top of that, they can then rotate them against each other. So this is really a next level of, um, of experimental capability. But the magic angle is not so sharp when it comes to the superconductivity. It's not sharply correlated with the emergence of superconductivity. Yeah, that's really excellent, you know. So, um, but do you think that we, we could see or realize high temperature superconductivity in twisted graphene? Um, but, I mean, uh, well, depends on how we define high temperature. Because one of your conclusions is that it's, you, you mentioned yeah. high temperature superconductivity. <laughs> twisted yeah, graphene. And I'm pretty certain it will be another heterostructure. It will okay. be another twisted structure. I mean, they're currently taking all the van der Waals coupled systems and try to rotate them. As soon as you have van der Waals coupling, it seems at least experimental hopeful that you can rotate them against each other. They do it with uh, tungsten disulfide and others. I know there's, in, in, for example, in, what's his name? Ugh. Pazupathy. Hmm. That's this guy, right? yeah. 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 He gave a colloquium <laughs> recently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. So there's a lot of activity on trying different Moray systems. And I think very soon we will have many more and some of them will potentially be prone to higher TC superconductivity. 
I, I don't dare to say hi to see super connectivity at this point. Uh, if there are no questions, Roni, I have a very short question about mechanical topological uh, oscillators. Yes. So, like in the context of acoustics, we talk about gallery modes, which are edge modes. Yes. Now, I'm sure there are these you know, fantastic galleries in Italy and in Germany, but there may be some intrinsic chirality. So, have they already discovered gallery modes which go in only one direction, not in both directions? Yes. I, I'm asking uh, if uh, there are gallery modes which are chiral, which, which go in yes. one direction. Yes. Well, there are. So there was a science, maybe that's what you're referring to. There was a science paper by uh, uh, Sebastian Huber, uh, Süßtrunk and Huber, science paper 2015. Again, a strange German name, Süßtrunk. Uh, but Huber is easy to find, H-U-B-E-R. Uh, it's a science paper from 2015. They, they actually measured the chiral mechanical boundary modes. Oh, I'm not aware of that. Okay, I see. Thank you. Because that's also one thing you could interact with mechanical engineers at I8 Metals also. Yeah, sure. You know, okay, by the way, I have a couple of suggestions for mechanical systems that are particularly interesting for mechanical systems because the application, the technological application would be more viable there than in circuits or other platforms. You see, since we started doing the circuits, you're learning about the principal mechanisms of realizing these states in different platforms. So I would be very much uh, interested in, in accessing mechanical systems too. Shiva has a question. Hey. Hi, Ronnie. I, I wanted to continue on, on the earlier question, but I just wanted to point out that uh, this concept of the churn number and, and the topological charge, of course, you also realize this purely with light fields. And, and you can indeed uh, also have non-reciprocal, non uh, say, flow of light by, by introducing, uh, say, a Faraday isolator where, where, where flow in the reverse direction just like a diode block. Yeah, that, that's the essence of the Holden Ragu paper. Yes. That's exactly what he says. So I don't know if pe maybe people have already realized it there. Of course. In, no, no. Oh, okay, maybe I should be clear. This, this field in optics has become huge already. Like everything is there. They have waveguides, photonic crystals, optical fibers, you name it. I mean, this is a huge field. As I said, by citations, it's bigger than condensed matter on it. So the first paper where such a topological insulator of light was realized is by now five, 6,000 times cited. It has become, the, the field has become huge in optics, but the field is quite young in alternative platforms aside from optics. Yeah, yeah. so um, I recently came across a talk where one could generate sort of chiral sound waves. Of course, this is, this was yeah. from Miles Paget, but I, that, that was also yeah. quite quite interesting. From since you were talking about it's, uh, it's at this level as a theory level, it's all the same. You want interference, you want a Barry curvature, you get it, and then you can get topological edge modes via bulk boundary correspondence. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but okay, so I was asking you earlier about the polyacetylene molecule. Uh, yeah. It may. Also Cool to realize these effects on well with circuits on very large uh, spatial scales one, one might say but also on um, say say synthetic molecules and with, with electrons which, which oh yeah yeah so uh, don't overextend that slide it, okay it looked like oh great you know uh, the carbon is just replaced by a capacitor but it's only replaced by a capacitor when all I want is this mid gap state. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a trustable map. It's not a map. I, I don't believe I can use circuits to to rebuild molecules. I am very uh, uncertain of that. But um, again, all I wanted to resolve is the topological feature inherent to the molecule and inherent to the circuit, and this is the same. 
okay okay i i get get your point and it was in that context i was wondering if uh, if the finite sizes of these circuit elements and the the i mean i i can place a capacitor a series of capacitors and inductors within a certain uh, certain distance say few millimeters or say few centimeters should the the excitation have wavelengths which are also of uh, sufficiently long wavelength that two of these circuit elements yeah. are yeah don't worry about that the propagation velocity of electrons in a wire yeah, yeah. is how, how much i mean like 10 to the 5 meters per second so uh, yes. now imagine we have an operating frequency of yes. 100 uh, we have an operating frequency of 100 kilohertz so it is yeah. three or four orders of magnitude uh, forgiving to spatial differences of the of the, of the of the electric component elements. So that's why I told you during the talk already, as long as we are in the kilohertz regime, we don't worry about this stuff at all. Like this, that, that's not a, but when Professor Rao comes into play and we add, is there a terahertz uh, um, implementation? Okay. Then okay. the things are very important. And clearly I would be talking entirely out of my depth I would need to rely on electrical engineers to help me on these questions. Okay, that's that's uh, nice to know. I will follow up on this. Indeed, I was wondering about regimes like like uh, gigahertz and terahertz, if if anything, because that's also of considerable interest uh, these days in other areas. Shiva, you yeah. can initiate that work here, and. With I mean, to generate a terahertz wave is in, in within a few terahertz is not so complicated. Uh, all the same, yeah, but the components. I mean, you see, the yeah. components are difficult. I mean, if you give me an inductor that operates in a terahertz regime. <laughs> That's a problem. Yes, <laughs> but, uh, that was also <laughs> my question. Can I replace it with a resonator? Uh, is the Q uh, and and these properties important, or do I really need a physical inductor? No, okay, so that's a question I had asked two or three years ago when I already saw that it's ugly with these inductors. And the main problem we had, I mean, we were basically first year student when it comes to soldering circuit boards, okay? Our main problem first was the crosstalk between the inductors. It was horrible. We couldn't measure anything. So we had to put like some extra isolation over these inductors to make, to, to, to prevent any crosstalk. Uh, I'm sure for most oh, okay, for most of these topological states, we can avoid inductors. And as soon as we can avoid inductors, all we would need sometimes would be operational amplifiers and capacitors. So the operational amplifiers are an issue by themselves. But as far as I do, I'm not claiming to know enough about electrical engineering, but at least the worst guy in the game is the inductor. And in most cases, we can avoid using inductors. As you know, there's a there's a similarity transform between capacitors and inductors in electric networks. Yeah, that, that's really nice. Thank you. Yeah. So if there are no further questions, it seems, then let's thank Professor Rani Tamale for a wonderful talk, uh, uh, which uh, as you can see, we all thoroughly enjoyed in all aspects. So thank you, Ronnie, so much for covering so much breadth and to keep all of us entertained. <laughs> hopefully so. And thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And hopeful, hopefully I can see many of you soon in, in China. You're, you're yes. most welcome. And we are looking forward to that. And, you know, on, on behalf of uh, our entire team, I thank you, Professor uh, Ronnie, for a wonderful and clear, beautiful talk. We really enjoyed it, you know, the new frontier, uh, frontiers and collective phenomena in synthetic matter. And, uh, you know, we'd like to see you in our campus sooner than later. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of your day. Thank you very Thank much. You too, have, a, have a great day. Uh,